correlation of sacrifice to worship. It is unthinkable. In fact, in the Old Testament, it was completely unacceptable to worship God without sacrifice. We need to be very clear on something, that what we call worship, strictly, is not worship without a sacrifice. But you say, Pastor, how are we going to bring the lambs and to kill them in here? You're not. But as we'll see, that in this correlation here, it's going to, we're going to learn how we can have that same sacrifice. I, I would say to you this, by, by Bible standards, by Bible standards, when it comes to worship, we are religious wimps. Let me say that again. By Bible standards, when it comes to worship, we are religious wimps. We don't want to get our hands dirty. We don't want to get messed up. We want things nice and clean and tidy. We love the air conditioning. We like the chairs in a row. We like to know the floors are going to be sweeped. We have to have something for our kids. We have all these things. We're going to come here, enjoy the worship, go on back. We don't know how to worship God. Folks, it's embarrassing. We literally... Bring nothing whatsoever to worship God with. What should I bring? Well, we could start by bringing our life and our, our time and investing our time in worshiping God. We could also invest our abilities and our talents. Where there is no sacrifice, folks, get it down. We, we're going to see this so absolutely clear. No sacrifice, no worship. We are deceiving ourselves and thinking that worship is coming towards us. It is not. If we're worshiping God, it is God-centered. Our worship is so self-centered. We think because we've had a great song service and, and the, the music has been fantastic and it's moved our hearts, we think we've worshiped God. We desperately need to go back to Leviticus. We desperately need to see what kind of worship is pleasing to God. Holiness and purity are another, another theme that's raised. Holiness is the central theme of the book of Leviticus. More than 150 times the root word is used in the book of Leviticus. The concentration of that term is so dense, more dense in this book than any other book of the Bible. I suggest to you, and, 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 and we, have this, we have this idea of correlating holiness and legalism. We think the better we keep the rules, the holier we are. Wrong, wrong, wrong. In Leviticus, there's clearly this matter of separation. In Leviticus 20, 26, he says, And you shall be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy, and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. There's a couple of examples I used about the wrong fire, the example of bless, blasphemy. He also correlates how holiness and purity. What does it mean to live in the presence of God? Honestly, what does that mean? We I, Actually, if you want to know, ask me. I think it's a frightening thought. I really do. I think it's a frightening thought to live in the presence of holy God. We need to look at this clearly to get rid of fears that we might have and to give us a clear understanding of what that should mean. We also need to look at the matter of atonement and presence. Atonement and presence. Atonement comes from a combination of two words, at one, at one meant. So when we are atoned, we are at one with God. A word, an English word that would better explain that would be expiation. Expiation means purification or removal or sin of its guilt. And this verb form occurs 50 times in the book of Leviticus. Atonement with God for the children of Israel 
only occurred through the shedding of blood. Leviticus takes very seriously a concrete presence of God. Now, here's something we need to understand. And um, I'll, I'll go into this a little bit more detail next week. But we're a very physical people. In our world today, we don't have a very good sense of the spiritual world. We don't have a very good sense of the reality of the spiritual world. For us, our reality is the senses. We can see it, touch it, smell it, feel it, and all that kind of stuff. It, it, that's our reality. But in fact, folks, in fact, the spiritual is a reality even more so. And, and, and here's, what I, here's why I say that. Listen carefully. I live in this physical body, but I will live spiritually outside of this physical body. The physical is temporal. The spiritual is not. It continues. We, we, should, we should know and understand how the physical and the spiritual coincide with each other and how we live physically in the presence of God. Leviticus takes this very seriously and seeks to discover what it means to live life in the presence of holy God. I suggest to you that that's a very important thing. Now, <clears throat> Just a couple of things that I want us to get in closing. And that is this. First, God has not changed. God has not changed. The God that we read about in the Old Testament that seems strict and fierce and angry and who is absolutely unaccepting of evil and wickedness and error and sin. That's the same God today, folks. Same God. We have to reckon with that. Now, and, and, and let me say this. Let me say this very carefully before you leave and say, I'm never going back to that church again. I don't need that kind of preaching. Let, let me just hang with me here, okay? Let me say once again, this is an introduction, okay? Because in, while, there's this, while there's this physical reality of the sacrifices, those sacrifices have been transformed to, for us today. There is a sacrifice we perform. We just don't do it physically with, with lambs on altars. In fact, as I'm thinking about getting rid of this and having an altar placed here for the, for the duration of our, of our series, I'll leave the sheep out. But uh, <clears throat> the thing is, the physical sacrifice is not obsolete. It's been transformed. There's a spiritual sense that we need to understand. So, in a spiritual sense, Jesus' sacrifice has no beginning and no ending. We, we, we go back, and, and again, you, you'll see this over and over. We go back to the cross. They didn't know it then. They went through these rituals pointing forward. They, they were going through these rituals because these were, it was part of the rhythm of their life and the way they did things, and, and so they, they performed them. We look back and we go, wow, look what that was pointing to. The study of Leviticus and its ritual sacrifices, it's very relevant to our world today. Leviticus tells us about the character and the will of God. Here's what will happen, folks. As we begin looking at the character and the will of God, some of us are going to say, you know what? I don't want anything to do with that. I promise you. Some people are going to say, that is not a God I want anything to do with. But others will come to see where God is leading us, where he's taking us. Like he was taking the people there and in, 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 in the, the, he was taking them through to the promised land, to the land flowing with milk and honey. Stay with me, folks. We'll get there. Leviticus tells us about the character and will of God, and if we will know God, we must know this book. And then the last thing I'd like for us to take away from this, and the title of the series is The Presence. How to live in the presence of God. How can we live in God's presence? The key to God's presence 
is in the obedience of his people. But, let me tell you something. We all disobey, don't we? Do I hear an amen on that? <laughs> yeah, I can tell that maybe we need to lighten up the message a little bit here. <laughs> so, let's just end by saying we're all sinners, right? We, we all, we're all broken. We're all fallen. We all need redemption. It all comes at the cross. It's all pictured for us through the sacrifice. But the key to the presence is obedience. Therefore, we need to know what happens when we disobey. What happens? Because within us, there needs to be that longing desire to be in the presence of the Most High God. So, folks, <laughs> stay with me, okay? Um, it's a fascinating book. And um, I have to say thank you because you let me study this all for the last however many weeks. And I get to study just volumes. But I can only bring in a few minutes at a time here. And so I say thank you for letting me. And, and if I appear, appear a little excited about it, I totally am. I just wish I could see on your faces how excited I am about it, okay? And maybe, maybe we'll get there. Let's pray, shall we? God in heaven, even the fact that we bow our heads and talk to the God of heaven goes back to Leviticus. How do we come to you like this? How do we approach the Most High God with our prayers and, and speak to you openly and, and even casually like this? And, and how do we bring our heart's message to you? Lord, I'm so grateful that we can. Indeed, we do and we should often come to you. And so as we look through this series, I ask you once again, God, that you uh, help us to see your heart and your mind. Help us to see the heart and mind of your people and the interaction that took place between you and your people. And God, that it would instill in us this desire to, yes, be in your presence, but huh, to walk with God, that's a promise for us. Let that be a desire in our heart, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, folks. Let's stand up. And uh, <clears throat> we have our brunch that's ready now. And uh, brunch happens first Sunday of the month. And you're all welcome to come and participate and hang out and visit with people and, uh, and uh, get to know some folks you haven't met before. But I really encourage you to do so. We try to keep it simple and uh, so everybody can enjoy it and be a part of it. I want to say thank you very much for coming today. And uh, please have a great week. God bless you all. Bye-bye.